thanks to Sarah for another great uh, welcome in video this morning, a recap from yesterday. So that, uh, I'm glad you uh, stopped and, and gave that some attention there this morning. So good morning, KTI stars. Good morning. Uh, those of you who joined us last night look like you're having a good time. We appreciate you coming out. Okay. Uh, better on this side. I probably should have walked in front of the mic for the, those things. So, oh, you had your mic turned on too, but that didn't matter. So, okay. But anyhow, uh, thanks for coming out last night. We hope you love the Roaring Twenties event. There was a lot of energy in the room. The establishment really enjoyed you guys being there. The owner came to see what that was all about. Uh, the operations manager, good time and everything like that. So. Um, we'll uh, talk some more about what the day's like today in just a few minutes, but we're going to open up with a star story from longtime videographer of KTI, Sarah Wall. have a streak of luck. My mom says that my brother has a Midas touch. He can find anything on Facebook Marketplace within 30 seconds and have a really good deal and find something really solid. Um, my sister has kind of career luck where she just absolutely blew it out of the water. And there are some areas where, you know, we trade. Um, I am somebody who has a certain kind of luck that I found. Does anybody know what this is? No, this is a stumble bump. Um, I am a Check and Connect mentor in my school up in the last couple of years, and I have a mentee who tends to find those speed bumps and he kind of stops. So we started talking about them being stumble bumps because it's not about how fast you go, it's one of those situations where you're walking across the carpet and all of a sudden you're tripping on thin air. It's one of those. You can't help it, you don't see it coming. It's just one of those, and then you continue on with your day. So I have stumble bump luck. That's just me. So I learned I wanted to be a teacher kind of early in my life. Um, I was an odd kid. I was confident in myself. I never really belonged to a group, but I was the floater. I could get along with everybody. So I didn't really have a group. I didn't have close groups, but I fit in everywhere in a weird way. Um, in ninth grade, I took algebra. I'm an art person, not necessarily strong in math, but I can reason and logic myself through that. Um, I, unfortunately, was that person that, to my poor algebra teacher, he prayed that he was not known for his patience. He was the football coach, not necessarily somebody who wanted to be teaching algebra to the little ones. But we hit those letters are numbers and numbers are letters section of algebra. And um, I was in there every day, every morning, trying to understand. It turned out that all my mom had to say is, Sarah, you don't have to understand why the formula works. You don't have to know why they do what they do. Just plug it in. That's what it took. And after that, I was like, oh, OK. But it took that. But I got to the end of the year with a B. I'm an AB student. I've never been somebody who has to have that 100%, but I'm solid. I went to my guidance counselor for scheduling and said to him, I want to take it again. And he looked at me like some of you are looking at me, which is fine, but I'm used to that. And he said, well, why? You passed. I said, because I don't think I understand it well enough to keep going. I need that base. I, I was a weird kid, like I said. So, all right, and you know, looking at me with that kind of weird look, he said, okay, and let me in again. Well, this is what I remember about my 10th grade algebra teacher. This is not a picture of him, but this is what I remember about him. 
Mr. Putney, and I can say that because he's well past retired. Um, Mr. Putney was the person who was in his last year before retirement. Mr. Putney, unfortunately, had checked out, and he was that person where he would teach for five to ten minutes, snap open the newspaper, and sit at the desk. This is where I learned I wanted to be a teacher. It's kind of a weird parallel. But there were two girls who were a year older than me, so they were in 11th grade, 9th grade, one of the two. Um, but I knew more than I thought I did. And I could turn to them beside me, and I was teaching them algebra. I was teaching them what I had learned the year before. I got aha moments before I was even certified as a teacher. That's what I was dreaming for. Now, granted, my family is a very supportive group of unicorns. <laughs> We're one of those tight-knit families you don't hear much of. Um, and I, my mom was very supportive of me choosing to be an art teacher. But she could tell that, you know, we're a very practical family. And she said, okay, if this doesn't work out, what's your battle plan? Um, so we did have that contingency plan talk. But I got into college, did all the college things, um, worked with work study and making sure that I was pulling my own weight, worked three part-time jobs even after I graduated, and basically just made sure I could survive. Um, so that's stumble bump number one. Is because I got to a point where I was in my almost to last semester and something didn't feel right right after I scheduled. Didn't feel right. So I went to my advisor and said, can you look this over one more time? Okay. He said I was good. Still didn't feel right. I went to the assistant dean of education. I'm like, something's off. Something feels wrong. I have no proof that something feels wrong. They checked it over. This is still in class change time. Okay, good. Come to the end of the semester, I go to schedule my student teaching, which you can teach at that time. You could not take other courses during. It was a 12 credit course, and I considered that a full load. They said, well, this isn't going to work. What are you talking about? Well, oh, these classes don't qualify for your core, some of your core coverage. You'll have to take those before you can student teach. It's like only two, two classes. Okay. He was looking at me like he expected me to blow up. I'm like, well, there's no going back now. So the only thing we can do, getting mad about it, it's not going to change anything. So I'll just take some extra courses that will be beneficial for me later on. I'll fill those in. I'll make a semester out of it. So extra semester later, I graduate. Again, working those three part-time jobs, getting through subbing, ice cream stand, waitressing, found out that if you have an extra pair of shoes in the car, you can make your feet last longer during the day and change those pressure points even if they weren't any better shoes than what you had before. And eventually got to a point where I went back to school to kind of extend a little bit because they give you a stipend in your student loans and I knew that wasn't a long-term solution. I was just trying to patch it through until something might come up. And I was in the middle of a class with a professor. And that professor said to me at one point, because I had talked up too much, I don't, I'm an extroverted invert, introvert. Like I'm one of those people. It still costs me emotional coins to interact with people throughout the day, but I'm okay with it. Um, she said to me, why aren't you in a master's program? Well, because master's is more money. If I'm gonna take out student loans I don't know I can bank on, I wanna do it smart. So she said to me, well, if you got an internship, they would pay for that. Like, well, how, and I said to her out loud, I know, but how many of those are just laying around? And she said, no, you don't understand. I'm offering you one. <laughs> the window has closed. I will push it through. Um, and so that opportunity landed on my lap. Right about the time I interviewed for a job in my dream position, in my alma mater school district, taking over for an art class teacher that I loved having for class. And I was put on a path where I had to choose, did I go for a career or did I go 
and pursue a master's and take my chances. I chose to have health care. <laughs> I mean, that, that's what it boiled down to. I was offered a sweet spot, and I was hired. I was hired at the high school level. I was hired as a traveling teacher. It was a new position, but okay. I was traveling between my old high school and 120 miles away, which was perfect because it was just enough time to decompress in the car plan and hit the ground running. Perfect. What is a contract year? Haha. <laughs> Did I get hired to get fired? Is that what happened? Um, and, you know, it was one of those on edge, like, am I going, am I not going, am I going, am I not going? It took us a few years to get a contract, so that was always in limbo. Um, I had one saving grace. There were two art teachers hired at the time, and I pulled the straw. I had one day seniority on her. Thankfully, she was not let go either. She was not that. Um, but here's the problem with that. My first three years, I spent doing different positions. My first year was traveling between two high schools. My second year, I got situated in a high school, caused a lot of drama because that wasn't my choice to replace the other teacher. She loved me for that. Um, and then my third year, we went through some budget cuts again. And I saw the writing on the wall that there were not going to be one and a half art teachers at the high school anymore. So there just happened to be an elementary school lead, teacher leaving. I had no desire. Kindergartners terrifying me. <laughs> terrifying me. Now, not anymore. They're one of my favorite groups, but they absolutely terrified me because I didn't know what the heck to do with them. Um, so I ended up teaching <laughs> K through six art to 500 kids. It was a whole different setup. And. Um, I don't know if you know anything about teaching kindergarten kids or elementary school kids in general. This is what the media shows you. <laughs> if you elementary, you're laughing right now. I learned very quickly that they're a different sort of animal. Um, because what I ended up doing was in the first project, I, you know, we knew, we're all been first year teachers at some point. The first year is survival, second year is tweaking, third year, now you're getting your own. And my first year, I was like, okay, what did my elementary art teachers do? Self-portraits. That was a good intro. That was enough to kind of show what they had and what you could evaluate. Okay, so I did self-portraits of third graders, and this was the result. <laughs> 25 kids in unison tears. Achievement. Everybody in tears. I don't, and it, it was day one. They drew the oval. Not the eyes, not the mouth, not the nose, the oval, and they were in tears. So I did what any logical thinking person would do. I went through that car crisis on the way home, like, where do I go from here? Throw in the towel or try and fix this. Um, so what I ended up doing was what any sane person would end up doing. I went home, grabbed a hot glue gun, and made a cardboard coffin. Seriously. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm actually not joking about that. I seriously did that. So I went home and I, I brought this thing to school, plopped it on the table the next day, and the first thing my classes heard from me was, guys, I am so sorry. I am sorry that we went through that struggle, but you know what? Sometimes that happens, and I'm learning too. So if you guys will be patient with me, I have something that we're going to do today. We're going to stick with this. But if you come in bad artists, my expectations is that you leave better bad artists when you leave. I do not have to be your favorite special. I just want you to learn a little bit. So what we did was what we called, and I found online, was an I can't eulogy. We wrote down everything that we said we couldn't do. And for those students who ran up to me, I don't know what to write. I can't think of anything. Ta-da! Even if that's your only entry, your congratulations, you found one. And I hammed it up with this I can't usually eulogy. Welcome, friends, to the funeral of I can't. He is, and on and on and on. To the point where I had anticipated this, and I said, you cannot giggle. You're going to hold hands, you're going to look sad, but you cannot giggle until I'm done. And of course, that set the tone. I was nervous, because who the heck does that in the middle of class? But what these kids were lacking was growth mindset, 
not ability. So I have worked very hard in my classroom to get that growth mindset going. But unfortunately, I am one of those people that I am a department of UNO. I am a specialist. I have, I'm not going to say no support, I have support. But it's kind of like talking, me talking to a car mechanic. Yeah, I know the basic parts. I know why my rocker panels right rounded out. But please don't ask me to fix the piston. I know what you're talking about. I don't have the details. They know what I'm talking about when I talk to colleagues, but not in the same way. I am a sounding box of one. And my fear, even in my year four, was that I would become an echo chamber. I went into my role knowing that I would have to defend what I do. I am not crafty time. I am not coverage for your plan time, although that's really good job security. I also know where I fit in the big picture, that's fine. I am STEM. I am STEAM. I've had kids in my classroom say, this isn't math class. This isn't science class. You would be shocked. And I tell them that outright, and I list examples. So I went to my principal and said, hey, I keep investigating this. I hear there's this thing called patency. Is there any chance I could go? She said, hold that thought. Okay. And then I ended up here, nominated for this thing called KTI. I'm like, okay, let's go see what this is. Now, I don't know if you can notice in this picture, but at least on a computer screen, there are two neon white people in the middle of this crowd. <laughs> One of them is my good friend, Holly Woodard. She's just above the Pennsylvania banner. And the other one, like, one to the right and one above, that one's me. <laughs> we fit the neon white profile. That was the first time I walked into a room, and this sounds silly, but I know some of you will get it. People invited me to the table. They sought me out. I'm usually that background echo, and I'm happy to be there because I was used to being a floater. I'll get along with everybody, but I don't really have a notch. This was the first time people actively sought me out to join their group, other than my family, again, unicorns. But that was the first time. And they've slowly sucked me in ever since. This is my seventh year on staff. I've loved every minute of it. Um, it's one of those things that it catches. And I can tell you, I was gonna, I, Scott's gonna twitch. I thought about bucking the plan when I did this speech until Tom just spoke yesterday. He covered what I thought needed covered because I heard a lot in sessions the last two days. I see you through a camera lens. I hear the clips. I see you in person all the time. I'm not enough. I couldn't do what they do. Let me tell you something that I know in private talks with all of those lead learners. Every single one of those lead learners back there tells themselves that. And I'm still measuring myself up to people like Karen Staggerwall and Missy Halcott and Tom Tanson and Ann Newman. That is not unique. That is human. Human is not bad, but you have to be aware that you are your own worst critic. What you do is amazing. My story is nothing fancy. It's no drama. It's just stumble bumps. And those stumble bumps are just that. You don't see them coming. We overcome them every day. That's all this is. You plug along and you keep over the stumble bumps. And I know, just hearing from this group and seeing what I'm seeing this week, I'm in trouble. My position's up for grabs. And I hope you make me fight for it. <laughs>